Good evening. Thanks for being with us. Let me say up front that this is not a story about North Korea uh, and that that's kind of the point. But on October 9th, 2006, at around 10.30 a.m. local time, the ground started to shake beneath a small village in the northeast corner of North Korea. Halfway around the world, back here in the U.S., seismologists recorded what looked to be a 4.3 magnitude earthquake. But what happened in North Korea that morning was not an earthquake. It was a nuclear explosion. Kim Jong-il defies the U.S. and the world and claims to have set off an atomic weapon. That day in 2006, the secretive, repressive North Korean regime showed the world that they had built and tested a nuclear bomb. A rogue country building nuclear weapons, threatening to proliferate that technology, stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. But when 9-11 happened and the U.S. government announced that those actions would now constitute a grave and unacceptable threat to the United States, there was no radical change in our actions toward North Korea. There was no move by the U.S. to disarm that country after 9-11. Instead, the U.S. went into Iraq. If the threat of weapons of mass destruction was the driving force for U.S. action after 9-11, why Iraq rather than North Korea? At the time, North Korea really was building a nuclear bomb and threatening to proliferate that technology. Iraq wasn't. The case for war in Iraq that was presented to the American people proved to be a smokescreen. There were no weapons of mass destruction. There was no reconstituted Iraqi nuclear program. The case that was made publicly for that war turned out to be false. What was true? What was the reason for that war? We know that it wasn't the reasons that they told us. So why did we really do it? Newly obtained documents from both here and abroad, as well as interviews with many of the key players in the war planning process and in the invasion, now provide an answer to that question. The question of why we did it. Watch. I will swear to not only uphold the laws of this land. Summer, the year 2000. But in order to lift the spirit of this country when I put my hand on the Bible, I will also swear to uphold the honor and the integrity of the office to which I have been elected. So help me God. We love you, God! As the presidential race heats up, the turbocharged U.S. economy of the roaring 90s is threatening to stall. Thanks very much. The problem is energy costs, oil costs, a looming new U.S. energy crisis. And in the United States and throughout the world tonight, the rising prices of oil are beginning to be a drag on these boom economic times. The high price of oil and the soaring price of the pump have been at the top of the national conversation for months now. With global energy demand on the rise and U.S. dependence on foreign oil at an all-time high, George W. Bush turns America's looming energy crisis into a central issue for the presidential campaign. We've got a potential crisis in the energy markets because we've had no energy plan. And um, it's, uh, to me, that's, the, uh, that, 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 that's a possible uh, problem for the next administration. When it's clear that he will be the Republican nominee, and with energy taking center stage in the campaign, Bush taps Dick Cheney, a man with deep experience in both politics and the oil industry, to be his running mate. I believe you're looking at the next vice president of the United States. The two running mates make the case that the Clinton administration did not know how to handle the issue of oil, but a George W. Bush administration would. Those gasoline prices are going up. You know why? There's been no energy plan. The fact that we don't have an energy policy out there uh, is one of the major storm clouds on the horizon for our economy. Rewind a year before that election. Dick Cheney is CEO of the oil services firm Halliburton, speaking at the Institute of Petroleum's fall conference in London. He says there, for over a hundred years, we as an industry have had to deal with the pesky problem that once you find oil and pump it out of the ground, you've got to turn around and find more or go out of business. Looking ahead to 2010, by which time he says the world's energy needs will have increased by millions of barrels of oil per day, Cheney asks, where is the oil going to come from? Quote, the Middle East, with two-thirds of the world's oil and the lowest cost, is still where the prize ultimately lies. 
arguing that oil is the fundamental building block of the world's economy. The future vice president says governments and the national oil companies are obviously controlling about 90 percent of the assets. Companies are anxious for greater access there, he says, but progress continues to be slow. They sought oil that was just not accessible because of political circumstances. Oil that, if it could be accessible, was abundant and easy to market. When Dick Cheney gave that speech in London, and he was talking about the industry's interests. Later, he was talking about the government's interests, but the conclusion of both of those was the same. We need to get into the Middle East. In the summer of 2000, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein and his state-run oil company control about 10% of the world's oil reserves. Experts say Saddam has terrific leverage now because with demand for oil high and U.S. supplies at a 24-year low, the 2 million barrels a day of oil Iraq produces matter. My big fear is that Saddam Hussein is going to take the advantage of this tight market to cut oil production, and that could send prices up much higher. God bless you all, and God bless America. On the campaign trail, Bush and Cheney zero in on Saddam's control of vital oil resources as a potential threat to America's security. On the Clinton-Gore watch, Saddam Hussein's Iraq has become a major supplier of oil to America. This means that one of our worst enemies is gaining more and more control over our country's economic future. I think if we were to look for uh, something that could develop. It's uh, the possibility that we might find ourselves without adequate supplies of energy in the future, and uh, there'd no, be no quicker way to shut down our economy than that. As Bush and Cheney take office in January 2001, they inherit a country that is thirsty for oil and a familiar enemy who's sitting on a sea of it. In Iraq, the oil is right there on the waterfront. All you got to do is stick a straw in it, pipe it out to a boat, boat goes around the Straits of Hormuz, and there it is in European markets. What it has and what it puts onto the world market makes it a very important player. It was an oil man's mecca or utopia for sure. The secretive, repressive North Korean regime showed the world that they had built and tested a nuclear bomb. A rogue country building nuclear weapons, threatening to proliferate that technology, stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. But when 9-11 happened and the U.S. government announced that those actions would now constitute a grave and unacceptable threat to the United States, there was no radical change in our actions toward North Korea. There was no move by the U.S. to disarm that country after 9-11. Instead, the U.S. went into Iraq. If the threat of weapons of mass destruction was the driving force for U.S. action after 9-11, why Iraq rather than North Korea? At the time, North Korea really was building a nuclear bomb and threatening to proliferate that technology. Iraq wasn't. The case for war in Iraq that was presented to the American people proved to be a smokescreen. There were no weapons of mass destruction. There was no reconstituted Iraqi nuclear program. The case that was made publicly for that war turned out to be false. What was true? What was the reason for that war? We know that it wasn't the reasons that they told us. So why did we really do it? Newly obtained documents from both here and abroad, as well as interviews with many of the key players in the war planning process and in the invasion, now provide an answer to that question. The question of why we did it. Watch. I will swear to not only uphold the laws of this land. Summer, the year 2000. But in order to lift the spirit of this country when I put my hand on the Bible, I will also swear to uphold the honor and the integrity of the office to which I have been elected. So help me God. We love you, God! As the presidential race heats up, the turbocharged U.S. economy of the roaring 90s is threatening to stall. Thanks very much. The problem is energy costs, oil costs, a looming new U.S. energy crisis. And in the United States and throughout the world tonight, the rising prices of oil are beginning to be a drag on these boom economic times. The high price of oil and the soaring price at the pump have been at the top of the national conversation for months now. With global energy demand on the rise and U.S. dependence on foreign oil at an all-time high, 
George W. Bush turns America's looming energy crisis into a central issue for the presidential campaign. We've got a potential crisis in the energy markets because we've had no energy plan. And um, it's, uh, to me, that's, the, uh, that, 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 that's a possible uh, problem for the next administration. When it's clear that he will be the Republican nominee, and with energy taking center stage in the campaign, Bush taps Dick Cheney, a man with deep experience in both politics and the oil industry, to be his running mate. I believe you're looking at the next vice president of the United States. The two running mates make the case that the Clinton administration did not know how to handle the issue of oil, but a George W. Bush administration would. Those gasoline prices are going up. You know why? There's been no energy plan. The fact that we don't have an energy policy out there uh, is one of the major storm clouds on the horizon for our economy. Rewind a year before that election. Dick Cheney is CEO of the oil services firm Halliburton, speaking at the Institute of Petroleum's fall conference in London. He says there, for over 100 years, we as an industry have had to deal with the pesky problem that once you find oil and pump it out of the ground, you've got to turn around and find more or go out of business. Looking ahead to 2010, by which time he says the world's energy needs will have increased by millions of barrels of oil per day, Cheney asks, where is the oil going to come from? Quote, the Middle East, with two-thirds of the world's oil and the lowest cost, is still where the prize ultimately lies. Arguing that oil is the fundamental building block of the world's economy, the future vice president says governments and the national oil companies are obviously controlling about 90 percent of the assets. Companies are anxious for greater access there, he says, but progress continues to be slow. They sought oil that was just not accessible because of political circumstances. Oil that, if it could be accessible, was abundant and easy to market. When Dick Cheney gave that speech in London, he was talking about the industry's interests. Later, he was talking about the government's interests, but the conclusion of both of those was the same. We need to get into the Middle East. In the summer of 2000, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein and his state-run oil company control about 10% of the world's oil reserves. Experts say Saddam has terrific leverage now because with demand for oil high and U.S. supplies at a 24-year low, the 2 million barrels a day of oil Iraq produces matter. My big fear is that Saddam Hussein is going to take the advantage of this tight market to cut oil production, and that could send prices up much higher. God bless you all, and God bless America. On the campaign trail, Bush and Cheney zero in on Saddam's control of vital oil resources as a potential threat to America's security. On the Clinton-Gore watch, Saddam Hussein's Iraq has become a major supplier of oil to America. This means that one of our worst enemies is gaining more and more control over our country's economic future. I think if we were to look for uh, something that could develop. It's uh, the possibility that we might find ourselves without adequate supplies of energy in the future, and uh, there'd no, be no quicker way to shut down our economy than that. As Bush and Cheney take office in January 2001, they inherit a country that is thirsty for oil and a familiar enemy who's sitting on a sea of it. In Iraq, the oil is right there on the waterfront. All you got to do is stick a straw in it, pipe it out to a boat, boat goes around the Straits of Hormuz, and there it is in European markets. What it has and what it puts onto the world market makes it a very important player. It was a oil man's mecca or utopia for sure. The Ener Energy Infrastructure Planning Group was an interagency group that was put together in October of 2002, headed up by Mike Mobs, uh, that worked directly for Doug Fife in the Office of Secretary of Defense for Policy. The key mission was to put together a plan for the uh, kind of the reconstruction of the Iraqi oil sector. Our mission was to repair, restore Iraq's oil sector to the pre-war level before we went in. And we, we worked with the Corps of Engineers. We met at a contractor's location in Houston for a few days. Uh, I remember Lieutenant Colonel Shelton, we were all sitting around the table, 
and the contractor was asking several questions of all of us, and uh, they were they were asking questions about the need for for more information from the military to develop this plan. And I remember Paul uh, kind of set the plan the the tone of of the planning. He said, "Look," he said. We can get you a lot. The military can get you a lot of information, but he said you got to keep in mind the cost of that information is just not dollars and cents. The cost may be the lives of 19-year-old Marines and soldiers. So that set a tone within the planning proce process of just how serious this business was. He meant that uh, once the the war kicked off, that CENTCOM had the ability to get information, to supply information, but it was, it was probably going to cost, it may cost the lives of, of people because they were going to go out of their, their way to get additional information to develop this plan. I can remember the, the day that it all dawned on us that there was no WMD. Um, Ambassador Robin Raphael, who was the senior advisor for the Ministry of Trade, and she also was kind of the lead minister advisor. One day she invited these two army colonels to come in and talk about their recent uh, trip to the north to investigate the rolling WMD biological warfare rolling labs. And they came in and they gave about a 20-minute report on how these labs were nothing more than quality control laboratories to inspect the food that was coming across the border as part of the Oil for Food program. And I remember when they were finished, Robin looked around the room and said, well, it sounds like there's no WMD. Why are we here? And you could have heard a pin drop in that room. It, we, it all settled in that, hey, it seemed like we lost our legitimacy for being there. Cheney is uh, one of the great tacticians of government, uh, of managing bureaucracies of the modern era. I don't think there's any dispute about it. You know, he's a guy who really plays the game with force. He thinks through eight, nine, ten models and he thinks of each one 20 steps down the road. So what you see is Cheney shaping the government in these early days. He shapes it by altering a variety of very, very subtle uh, arrangements for the bureaucracy and how it works. And one of them is uh, turning the energy task force, where it's many of his friends from the oil industry, or that's who's on the task force, to shape energy policy for this new president. So here they are in meetings uh, in the old executive office building, the Energy Task Force, in February, uh, where what they're saying in the room is, is secret. So what you've got is the Energy Task Force in the Dome of Silence now, oil executives whiteboarding. Fellas, tell me what you'd like to see. That is exactly the way it worked. Literally, executives from oil companies giving a wish list to Cheney in secrecy. So there's no sunlight in there. And that's what shapes that energy task force. The key is not just that they get to put their wish list up on the board, but that it's done in secret. Cheney, he's thinking ahead. He's ahead of the curve. Eleven days into office, Bush assembles his national security team for the first time. Along with the vice president and national security advisor Condoleezza Rice, the principals include Secretary of State Colin Powell, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill opened up everything for the book I wrote about him in the Bush administration, including 19,000 documents. And in the first National Security Council meeting of the Bush presidency, January 30th of 2001, uh, O'Neill arrives with Colin Powell. According to Susskind, the central focus of the National Security Council's meeting that day is the Middle East, Iraq. Immediately, uh, there's talk of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And then Bush says, well, you know, I don't think much is going to be done over there. And then Bush says, well, what do you think uh, the big issue in the region is Kandi? 
to Condi Rice, at which point she says, I think Iraq is the big issue in this region, the destabilizing force, and that's going to be our focus. The reaction of both O'Neill and Powell, they're startled. O'Neill sort of summed it up, Bush basically saying, I want to overthrow Saddam, find me a way to do it. Not if, how. At this time last night, uh, at this very moment, in fact, President Obama was just wrapping up a high-stakes meeting in the White House Situation Room. President Obama assembled his national security team to weigh his options about what to do in Ukraine. That meeting lasted reportedly for more than two hours. That room, the Situation Room, is sort of the nerve center for the U.S. government when it comes to national security policy and urgent decision-making. It's that room where some of the most consequential decisions are made in terms of when and where to use U.S. military force around the world. And it was that same room in January 2001, eight months before 9-11, where one of the most confounding decisions about U.S. national security was made. It was a meeting that had consequences that we are still living with today. And even at the time, it stunned some of the people who were involved in it. Watch. Eleven days into office, Bush assembles his national security team for the first time. Along with the vice president and national security adviser Condoleezza Rice, the principals include Secretary of State Colin Powell, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill opened up everything for the book I wrote about him in the Bush administration, including 19,000 documents. And in the first National Security Council meeting of the Bush presidency, January 30th of 2001, uh, O'Neill arrives with Colin Powell. According to Susskind, the central focus of the National Security Council's meeting that day is the Middle East, Iraq. Immediately, uh, there's talk of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And then Bush says, well, you know, I don't think much is going to be done over there. And then Bush says, well, what do you think uh, the big issue in the region is Condi? to Condi Rice, at which point she says, I think Iraq is the big issue in this region, the destabilizing force, and that's going to be our focus. The reaction of both O'Neill and Powell, they're startled. O'Neill sort of summed it up, Bush basically saying, I want to overthrow Saddam, find me a way to do it. Not if, how. First weeks of the Bush presidency was when the decision was made, apparently, to take out Saddam Hussein, months before 9-11. Why was that decision made? It wasn't why they said, right? The public case for that war was a lie. So why did we really go? That has been an elusive question for much of the last decade, but now we think we have an answer. Why We Did It, our new documentary on this subject, premieres this Thursday night at 9 Eastern. I'm going to be talking about the documentary on The Daily Show tomorrow as well, because I really would like as many people as possible to tune in. I think what we found is really important, uh, and I hope you'll watch again Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Have a great night.